Okay. Let's see. Can y'all hear me? It's so weird to do all these by myself now. <laughs> hey, chat. Can y'all hear me or not hear me? <laughs> no one's told me yet. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Getting some yeses. Hey, guys. I love that you're putting where you're from. Um, so this is going to be super laid back. Thank you for the compliment on my hair. So side note, just because, you know, it's it's you and me here. Um, I I get keratin put in my hair like once every four years. And so I got it done and you're not supposed to crease it or wash it or do anything with it for 72 hours. So it's like hanging in my face and I feel like it's glued to my head. But um, it will make my life easier. Hi, highly recommend. <laughs> Um, but yeah, hey guys, y'all are from all over. This is so fun. Tell me where y'all are from, from to like, that doesn't make any sense. Where like Instagram or TikTok or where else? The Facebook group. Um, I would love to hear. Um, okay. So y'all are awesome. Thanks for joining. I have some like housekeeping things to go over first, and then I will jump into talking about being a Durham PA. Um, and I am going to try to stick to that topic since this is what this webinar is for um, and not as much pre PA stuff. Um, if we, I mean, we can get into some of that towards the end, but I definitely want to make sure I'm covering everything there is to be about, about being a Durham PA. Um, and I'm pretty much an open book, so feel free to ask questions. Um, I will be honest. I, my medical assistant I used to work with, who was one of my best friends, her name's Taylor. She would always tell me how like blunt and um, opinionated I am. So, um, all right, let's get to some housekeeping stuff. Hold on. Y'all are asking all the questions I'm about to go over. So um, if you've randomly found this and you're like, who's this random Durham PA doing this event? My name's Savannah. I am in Georgia. I've been a Durham PA for actually like probably six years this week. I think that I took my boards on August 14th. So I'm, you know, like right on my PA anniversary or whatever you want to call it. All right. Um, so with virtual shadowing, um, so let's talk about this idea of virtual shadowing, because I have I did a session with Archana, um, who is one of our coaches at the PA platform. And I don't know if any of y'all have done her shadowing events, which have been awesome. Um, and she's done some webinars as well, which is great. Um, so I did hers and it was more of just a q and I have this one a little bit more structured and I got the questions ahead of time to make sure I'm really, you know, talking about everything y'all had questions about and trying not to miss too much. But here's the thing with virtual shadowing. Number one, it is not going to be a substitute for real life shadowing um, because it's different. It's you're you're not seeing that. PA patient interaction. You're not seeing, you know, if you were to come into my office and actually shadow me, um, you know, you would get to see me going in and seeing patients by myself and maybe having issues where I have to go talk to my physician and bring her into the case and dealing with insurance issues and going over pathology. Um, so you're not really able to like see exactly everything, but um, I do think these events are good and it's something honestly that I've kind of done for a long time because, you know, I interview PAs all the time for the podcast and we talk about their jobs and we talk about what they do. Um, so in that case, you could almost call a lot of things virtual shadowing if all we're doing is talking about the PA profession. So um, when it comes to the question of will this count, that is completely school dependent. And it is also up to you if you want to put it on your application or not. If I was applying personally, I would, number one, be going to all these events because I love this kind of stuff. Um, but I would probably not put it on my application. It would be more of like a personal enrichment type thing where I wanted to make sure I was learning as much about the profession as possible. And also it's something great to talk about in 
you know, interviews, because where else are you going to get exposed to this many different types of specialties um, and PAs in different parts of the country? You know, my shadowing was limited to Georgia because that's where I am. But what we see in Georgia may be completely different than what a Durham PA sees in California. So I think they are awesome. Um, so there's not going to be a certificate for this. I can't tell you how many hours to count or if a school will count it because that's going to be school dependent. I've talked to some faculty and some directors and it's it's split across the board. Some of them are are doing um, shadowing opportunities. Some of them are not um, are accepting the shadowing opportunities. Sorry, I need to stop looking at the questions. They're distracting me. Um, but you know, it is up to you. You can always check with the school and see if they are accepting virtual shadowing. I heard one school, I don't remember which one, I don't think they told me, was accepting like th up to three hours um, of virtual shadowing. So that would be, you know, you could definitely use some of these, but if you do more than three, you're not gonna be able to count them. But if you put them on your application, another school may accept them. It's gonna vary. So it's going to vary across the board, like everything else in PA school applications. Um, so just kind of take that with a grain of salt. And I still hope you get a lot out of this. Um, so, yeah, we have a lot of people watching. All right. So let's see what else is on my. OK, replays. And I see some of y'all um, asking about this. Yeah, if you know what schools are accepting virtual sharing or not accepting it, put that in the chat. That's just going to help everybody else out um and I, and also on the um what's it called the um pre-pa club facebook group you can can kind of check in on there too so replays replays will be available so if you register for this which you would have had to if you're here um you will get a replay link i think it comes in 24 hours so you will get to watch the replay and then um i am planning since I want to, I want this to be very accessible in the future. Um, I'm going to set up these events because I'm planning on having more. I'll tell you all about that later. Um, but I'm going to set these up as a course on prepacourses.com, but it'll be a free course, something you can just sign up for to access the sessions later on. Um, I, yeah, I'll wait. I'll wait till the end to tell you about the next session, but don't let me forget. Um, all right. So here we go. So Western takes virtual shadowing, USC. Okay, cool. Um, I have some people helping out. So if you see Sheena or Emily in the chat um, answering questions, they are like my right hand people and know more or just as much as I do about everything. So they will be answering some of your questions too, or pointing you like where to find stuff. So um, yeah, they're kind of in there helping out tonight because I know the, the chat can get wild, right? Seton Hall. Okay, cool. Yeah. So some schools are, um, but again, like definitely reach out. Um, okay. Cool. So let's get into talking about being a Durham PA. Here we go. So um, let me look. I have, I have something like written out with stuff. So the number, one of the questions I first got was why did I go into Durham? How did I get into Durham? Um, and if you've listened to the podcast or watched some videos, you may already know this. But I did shadowing in dermatology when I was in college at UGA. I That was one of the only places I found that actually let me come shadow in Athens. And it was a wonderful Durham PA. Um, her name is Hope. Um, she actually has an Instagram now and she's still in Athens. It's really cool that we're colleagues now. And it, it's just really neat. So anyway, she I called the office. Um, here are some tips for if you want to shadow a dermatology PA or any PA actually. Um, when you call an office, ask to speak to the office manager. Um, don't just leave a message with the receptionist because there is a good chance that message will never get to where it needs to go. Um, so just ask to speak to the office manager. Most likely you're not actually gonna be able to talk to them. You probably will have to leave a message um, but even then, you know, leave a message, tell them what you're interested in, see if you can at least, you know, get a call back or send a resume if they want it, whatever. Um, 
because those are the people who typically make the decisions about whether someone can shadow in a practice or like facilitate that. Um, so I did that. I called and asked the speak the office manager and left a message for the PA and she called me back. She is the sweetest human being ever. And so I got to go shadow hope. Um, she let me come once a week for an afternoon and I mean, I guess like after the first time, she was like, you're not too weird and I can stand you or something. So um, it was really, really neat. I saw some really cool stuff um, going into it. I don't think I didn't have uh, an interest in dermatology necessarily. Um, I didn't know what to expect, I don't think, from it. And so it was more just me trying to shadow anyone who would let me. But I would say that's what made me very interested in it. Um, I think her Instagram is just hope the PA It's something like that, but I can post it on um, Instagram later. If someone reminds me to shoot me a message. Um, but yeah, so um, what are, I'll, I'll try to talk about some of the things I saw. So it was just her and a physician um, and she'd been practicing for a while. So she was really independent. Her physician did Mo's. So a lot of times her physician was doing surgeries and she was seeing patients in clinic and um we got to see a lot of acne. We were in a college town, so we got, saw a lot of college students. We saw some um, elderly patients, obviously, doing skin checks. <laughs> we do that all the time. And um, that's where I got to see really like my first procedures. So, you know, she was doing biopsies. Um, the first shave biopsy I ever saw, I was fine, like, good to go. This is cool, whatever. Um, then she did a punch biopsy and I almost passed out. It was the first time I'd ever seen that. It was on someone's knee. And I think I was just so in a punch biopsy, you numb it. And then you take this little kind of cookie cutter thing that you basically like push down and kind of, it's like a round blade. You push it down, pull out a chunk of skin in a perfect circle and then sew it up. And so, when she did that on the knee, I was just shocked at how deep it went. And, you know, when you feel your knee skin right here, it feels fairly thin, um, but skin is kind of deceptive and it, it just like popped out and it freaked me out. So she looked over at me and I was basically like white as a sheet. And she asked me if I needed to sit down and she was correct. So I was able to sit down and I didn't pass out that time. Um, but obviously I've gotten used to that since now I do punch biopsies and excisions and I'm fine. Um, another thing that really stands out from my time there, and I think I talked about this in my interviews was, um, this is what really kind of showed me the scope of a PA, but also like realizing when you need help kind of. So we had a patient come in and he was a teenager I think he was like 16 or 17 um, and he had a bump right here and it was, they thought it was a cyst. It felt like a cyst. Um, and so it was really bothering him. He wanted it out. Um, and so when <laughs> Hope went to take it out, cause like a lot of times you can punch around a cyst and take it out and put in a little stitch. Um, when she went to take it out, it, it started spurting blood, like literally just like spurts were coming out. And so um, I'm a college student without really any medical training, but I knew something was wrong. I was like, mm, that's not normal. Like that's not a cyst. And so she was very calm, cool, calm and collected, put pressure on there and said, Savannah, can you please go grab the doctor? And so I stepped out and went and grabbed the physician. She came in and then they worked together to kind of figure out what was going on. It turns out it was actually a small aneurysm of his temporal artery. Um, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, the, the doctor was able to kind of like they worked together, but the doctor was kind of able to like tie off the bleeding. Um, but she was like, listen, we're going to have to get you in with a plastic surgeon who can really kind of go in there and get this straightened out. Um, so we were able to, you know, call, get him in and figure it out. But it was 
it was an interesting experience and it, it really just from that one encounter, I learned a lot. Like I learned about reacting during an emergency and how to stay calm. Um, which now, you know, I've had my own patients who start bleeding way more than I think they should be. Um, and it, you know, I've, I've learned to kind of from hope's example and from my doctor's examples that I've worked with, just kind of keep my, my calm because it doesn't help anything to get, stressed out about it. Um, you really have to in medicine be able to kind of keep your, keep your chill, keep your cool in those situations. Um, and not that that's always possible, but, um, yeah. So anyway, that was, I got off on a tangent, but yeah, so I, um, I really love Derm. So going into PA school, it was definitely in the back of my mind, but I was very, very open um, during rotations, I liked pretty much everything. Psych was not my favorite, but I think part of that was just my setting. And that's something you'll find on rotations is you, some people have a great experience in one area and then others don't. And that's really just based on who you're working with or kind of the setting. So mine was like an inpatient psych academic center. And it was just some really tough cases. Um, it didn't affect me well, like mentally and emotionally. So that one wasn't my favorite, but I really love surgery and procedures and doing things. So my surgery rotation was with a general surgeon who did a lot of more like breast stuff, like breast reconstruction, breast cancer. Um, and I loved it. Like I loved the OR. I loved doing surgery. He let me suture a ton. Um, he let me cut. He let me do pretty much everything. And it was awesome. Um, so that I was like, okay, I'm going to do surgery. But then this derm position opened up and that was still kind of in the back of my mind. So when he had a connection to that office, I jumped on it. I was like, sure, I'll interview. Like if it doesn't work out, I'll look for derm. I'll look for surgery. Um, and so very thankfully I was able to go straight into derm out of school. Um, but yeah, but there are other areas you can do procedures. When I'm, I was on my ER rotation, I got to do some. I got to do, you know, a good bit of suturing there, um, but I don't do broken bones. I hate them. I hate ortho. I hate x-rays. I hate injuries. Um, those things still make me feel queasy and want to pass out. Um, they made me try to reset an eight-year-old's arm when I was in the ER and I, I had to leave the room <laughs> because I was about to fall on the floor. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that is how I got into Derm. All right. Um, so then let's talk about kind of what I do. So one of the questions I got was, you know, how do P how do Derm PAs, you know, do you do medical Derm, surgical Derm, cosmetic Derm? How do you differentiate what you do? And it completely depends on the practice. So, um, the pra like each practice is different and some practices are strictly medical, some are strictly surgical and some are strictly cosmetic and some do a combination of all of them. So I've worked at two different practices now. I'm at my second job and both of the ones I've been at have been a combination. So they've been a combo of medical, surgical and cosmetic. Um, and, you know, it's kind of not, not every place is like this, but in my cases, it's it's up to me. So like if I wanted to strictly do medical derm, that'd be fine. I could punt all of my surgeries and cosmetics to the physician and she would be perfectly fine with that. Um, but, you know, I feel like I want to be as well trained and well rounded in dermatology as I can be. But knowing that, I also know my limitations and know what I feel comfortable with when it comes to those things. And that's that's going to be part of being a PA in any specialty or any setting, um, because there's going to be a time when you have to say, like, this is out of my scope of practice or out of what I feel comfortable with. Um, or, you know, I I don't enjoy this enough to be proficient at it. And I think that's where in cosmetics um, I've worked with a couple of PAs who just don't have an interest in doing it. It's a very different patient population that comes in for cosmetic procedures and it can be hard. And so um, in doing cosmetics, 
you have to know when to say no um, and realize when you're not going to be able to fulfill what a patient is looking for. And, um, and it, I mean, not everyone, but they can be like a very needy pi patient population where there's a lot more hand holding, um, a lot more explaining expectations and, um, then trying to meet those expectations because sometimes it's hard for people to explain what they want to look like um, or what they want fixed and then have a practical result at the end of the day. Um, so when I, I do enjoy cosmetics, I don't do it's not the main thing in my practice. So my main practice is medical and then definitely some surgical and some cosmetic. Um, so that was just one of the questions I got that came to mind was like, I'm, I'm very interested in aesthetics. I'm very interested in cosmetics. How do I get into that? Um, it almost feels like art, like being creative. That sounds weird, but with someone's face, like it's so cool when someone comes in and they say, you know, this line here bothers me. And I get to talk about, you know, if we fill in your cheek here, um, and add some volume here, it's going to pull all of that up and give you this nice, um, not like it's not going to make your cheek puffy, but it'll kind of give you a more fullness here. And by pulling this up, you lose the line here. And then we don't have to just fill in this area. So there's, there's a lot of really cool techniques and different things with doing like fillers and Botox and, um, chemical peels, laser. Um, we just learned PRP, Microneedling, um, yeah, lots of stuff. Oh, y'all are frozen. Hmm, I don't know. We're not storming. Yeah, hit reconnect to the top if you're frozen. Um, but yeah, so my my question um, to anyone who is um, interested in aesthetics, my question is, why are you interested in it? Like, is it something you've shadowed or something that you just think is interesting? Um, or something you personally have had done. Um, and then definitely try to shadow in that area if possible, um, just to get a feel for what it's really like. Um, so uh, I think that maybe it's just that question. It's about cosmetics. And then surgical. So as far as surgery, so in my medical practice, I'm about to, um, in a minute, I'm going to go through my schedule from Monday. We're going to talk through those cases that I saw. Um, but medically, you know, I'm seeing acne, eczema, moles, skin checks, warts, molluscum, psoriasis. Uh, I don't even know. We'll see what's on the list. Um, seborrheic dermatitis, lesions, all kinds of stuff. Um, but, you know, I'm seeing normal stuff, but some of those things require procedures. So in my medical practice, there's procedures. You know, I'm I'm doing punch biopsies. I'm doing um, shave biopsies. I'm freezing things all day long. Um, but then I do have set surgical times for excisions and for um that's really the main thing. But like I'm, if I'm excising something, it's usually a cyst or a skin cancer um, or an atypical mole that may not be cancerous. Yes. Am I paused or am I not? I hope not. But if I get paused, click the reconnect button at the top. And then it should be recording for the replay, too. So, um, OK, so. Um, yeah, so I'm doing when I'm doing surgery, I usually don't do more than one or two a day. I try to um, schedule that at the end of the morning or the end of the afternoon to give myself time. Um, I'll tell you about one case. This was a few weeks ago. We were supposed to be going to lunch for the other PA's birthday. Um, and so um, I started a surgery. It was a skin cancer on this guy's arm, like 40s to 50s. Um, and he was on aspirin, which usually isn't a big deal. They might bleed a little bit more, but it's usually not too bad. But I started cutting that thing out and he was bleeding everywhere. I mean, it was it was so bloody. Um, and so I me and my medical assistant, you know, we had it under control like I know how to how to tie the vessels off and all that. 
Um, but it took forever. It, I mean, it almost took an hour, which normally I can cut a skin cancer out in 20 to 30 minutes, but we were just fighting this bleeding. Um, but it was fine. Got it out, went and ate my quesadilla and came back to work. Um, but that stuff happens. That's why I schedule it like that. Um, and when it comes to like, I think I saw a question about training. So when I got my job, um, I was able to set it up so that I did my first two electives um, with the job I was taking. So that was great training. Um, I was shadowing, but also learning procedures and all about derm because when I graduated, I did not feel ready to take on dermatology. We got two weeks of derm in our didactic year and it was like our second section. So it had been, you know, almost two years since I had even learned dermatology and yeah. So I needed a lot of refreshing, a lot of learning. Um, but I got, I was, I had a great teacher. Um, I was taking a PA spot. And so she was there for maybe three days before I came in, but she had this whole notebook of her notes that she had taken when she started. So that was extremely helpful, um, to have that. And, you know, me, the doctor and I would go through it. And as I saw things, I would ask questions. I was taking notes. Um, and then it got to the point where I was learning the computer system, the EMR, and like she would, we'd see two patients. She would do one note. I would do one note. And then she would kind of check on mine. Um, I was learning billing because that's not something you learn in PA school or at least not in mine at all. Um, and so it was a lot of training then. Um, so I did that. And then once I officially graduated, in August, I took two weeks off to study for boards, took boards, and then it takes a couple weeks to um, get the score back. So then I came back and kind of shadowed, worked again um, while we were waiting on that. And then as soon as my board scores came back, I could get licensed by the state officially. So then that took a couple weeks. So I ended up doing these like three months of shadowing, training, learning, where I really couldn't see patients on my own. Um, and then come like mid-September, October, when I was official, was when I, I didn't really, we didn't open my schedule per se, but there were things that I had learned that I could start seeing. So at that point, we started this like slow release um, I had been trained on how to do chemical peels, so I started doing those. I was doing check, like checkups and rechecks. So if I had seen a wart or something called actinic keratosis, which is just sun damage with the doctor um, or a rash that we kind of felt like would go away, um, I would do those follow ups and make sure they were good. Most of them were perfectly fine and they were things that I could handle. And then we started with, you know, some basic kind of acne stuff, um, acne follow ups and then new patient acne. But we tried to kind of slowly open the floodgates. But then um, at my practice, we actually had a lot of changes. So I was hired. Um, somebody asked about how I got my job. So I'll go into that a little bit. But um, yeah, I did get the offer while I was in PA school. I started, I, I graduated in August. So I started looking in January, um, applying in February, interviewing like February, March. And I also interviewed at, uh, with a spine surgeon and a neurosurgeon, um, got the job offer in April, did my rotations June and July, was there in August and then started officially, I guess. So, um, but yeah, so I I was definitely like trained on the job, got my job while I was in PA school. Um, but when I got there, it was just me and the doctor. And then that was in August. In like November and December, one of the big practices in town, um, the doctor retired. And so her other doctors didn't have anywhere to go. And so they decided to come join our office, but we had a tiny office. So then by January, we were moving offices and we had a new full time doctor and a new part time doctor. Um, so our office like doubled in size. Um, I started at four days a week. And then by January, they asked if I would start doing Fridays um, by myself with no one else in the office. And I said yes. So I'd start coming in on a half day on Fridays. Um, 
and and seeing basic stuff, but they were always available for me to call. Um, but so anyway, we we joined practices, and then in January, one of the doctors that joined with us was on was pregnant and got put on bed rest. So I had to see a bunch of her patients. So I went from like a fairly light, manageable schedule to the floodgates opened, and I was seeing like everything and everyone. But it was a great learning experience. It, it definitely pushed me. Um, that same year, the supervising physician that hired me got pregnant and went out on maternity leave. So um, there were some extenuating circumstances that I think made me have to learn things quicker, um, which wasn't necessarily a bad thing. I think someone asked the question of, you know, if there was ever a time where I um, didn't feel like I knew something and, and there definitely was. And even now there still is like, I def, I see weird stuff all the time being a PA and being the newest PA in a practice. I see the most new patients. And so I get, you know, a lot of those things that come in that are, are weird, a weird rash, a funky rash. Um, they like, it's funny because the doctor's like, all I see are skin checks and you get to see all the fun stuff. Um, Cause everybody looks at who works in Durham, like really loves it. And it, I always feel bad if a patient comes in with something weird. Cause we're so intrigued. We're like, oh, this is really cool. Like I've never seen this. So this is only the second time I've ever seen this. And so we get really excited. Um, oh, I did not get paid while I was doing my electives. That's why it's so great for the practice. Cause it was like free, free training months for them. I did get paid once I was um, done. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, so I, I definitely like seeing the weird stuff, but at first I didn't feel comfortable with psoriasis. Um, and now I feel fine with that. Pediatrics is still an area that I, it, there are things I feel comfortable with, but there are still things that I just don't see it as much. We do see pediatric patients, but when you're seeing them every once in a while, it's not the same as being all you see. Um, and so that's an area that I'm still learning. I'm, I'm actually hoping to find like a good virtual conference. There's, there's a great one out in California, but I've never been able to actually go to it. Um, so I'm trying to find a good conference for that. Um, and, and so that's something that, you know, I've, I've struggled with a little bit, but, it, it comes and goes. Um, hair loss can be hard, but I, at this point, feel fairly comfortable with that. Um, one thing that stinks about being in dermatology, somebody asked my least favorite um, thing from my profession. And um, I think one of my least favorite things is that there are a lot of things that we can't explain. Like, if a patient comes in with eczema, I can't tell them 100% why they got that or why they have it. And so that is that's sometimes difficult. Um, and because it's something that people can see on their skin, I think they ask those questions more than if they have high blood pressure or high cholesterol. You, like, you don't see that, so you don't really ask, like, why do I have this now um, versus something that is on the skin. So, yeah, um, but those are just just kind of some of the things. Sorry, I feel like I'm all over the place if I am tell me. But um, so I do want to go through my schedule and kind of tell you all about like what I see. So I can't show it to you because it has patient information on it, but we'll get into non-specifics without getting into HIPAA. Um, so this was my schedule from Monday. OK, one problem with having a lot of new patients on my schedule is I have a lot more no shows. I think that people, um, sometimes with skin, things just get better. Like you have a spot that looks weird and then it, it looks better or you have a rash and it goes away. And so if that's you, like make sure you can't your appointment so somebody else can have it. Um, but we're all human. So, um, so my day starts at eight o'clock. That's my first appointment time. I try to be at the office on time, but sometimes I'm running a little bit late. Um, my office does a kind of weird, um, a weird structure where we're like half paper charts and half EMR. So the nice things about it are that um, I, I, um, 
like never look at a computer at work. So that's kind of weird versus before at my old job, I was staying in front of the computer all day long. So it's like a nice break. Um, but at the same time, sometimes we have to go searching for a chart and that's kind of weird, but I'll dictate notes. So the, um, the medical assistant pulls everything up that they need from the computer, from the paper chart. They go room the patient, put them back, take a history. And then um, I go in, see them. They scribe and take notes on the paper while I'm in there. And then I come out, dictate my note, and I'm done. Um, and then they'll send the prescriptions. Um, and I'll talk about, somebody asked about like being a dermatology medical assistant. So I'll try to, try to answer that. Um, I'm going to let me answer some of these questions I've seen, too, because they're good. And then we'll get into my schedule. So the main differences between me and the physician at, at my office, there really aren't any differences. She will do bigger surgeries than I will. And that's just a comfort and preference thing. Um, so the way a lot of like like so in dermatology, a lot of times the way our, our schedule and stuff and contract is set up that we have a base salary and then um we get paid on collections. So how much we do, how much we work, um, how many patients we see or procedures we do. So for sometimes, like I would rather see four or five patients in the time that it would take me to do one big surgery that I probably don't really want to do anyway. Like I don't really want to cut things off the scalp because they bleed a lot. And this is just a preference. Um, if a, a cyst or a lipoma is bigger than about two and a half centimeters, I don't want to mess with it. Um, and depending on it's location dependent too. So like on a young person, I don't do a lot of stuff on the face. Um, I'll send those to my physician or plastics even. Um, <laughs> sounds really bad. Men's backs are really hard to do surgery on sometimes because this, is, this might sound gross to some people, but the skin is really thick sometimes. And so it, they're, they're like hard to pull together. And so if there's something really big on the back um, that I, I can just tell like this guy's muscular. It's going to be like, I'm going to be pulling that skin to try to stitch it together. A lot of times I'll kind of defer that a little bit. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so, um, so she'll do more, more invasive, bigger surgeries than me. I don't do melanoma surgeries, and that's just a preference thing. Um, to For a melanoma excision, you've got to take a big margin, and it's got to go down to fat um, or down to muscle. Sorry, you got to go through the fat to muscle. And so it is a big excision. And also, like, I'm only there right now at my job on Mondays and Tuesdays. And so I don't want to do a big surgery on a Monday or a Tuesday and then there be a complication that somebody else has to deal with later in the week. And so, um, yeah, so it's just my preference to do the smaller things. Um, but yeah, two, two and a half centimeters is about my, my, um, max there. Uh, okay. These are two questions I saw. Okay. How different are presenting symptoms for people of color? Was it a learning curve for you? It depends. Um, so at my, first job, I did not see as many black patients as I do at my job now. And I don't know if that's just where my office is located or why, but, um, but I, that was a little bit of a learning curve. I feel like the conference that I've been to do an okay job of trying to differentiate between different skin tones and types and all kinds of stuff. Um, but I, I did sign up for in September, there's a, um, skin of color update conference that I've always wanted to attend and it's virtual now. So I get to watch that. So I'm really excited. The agenda looks really great for that. Um, cause there, there definitely are, are differences. Um, but like a lot of things present the same too, and it's more like, so the most common skin cancer in black patients is a squamous cell. And so that's something that I just have to keep in mind because if someone comes in with something that they've been told is a war that isn't getting better, um, especially on the hands, like that might need a biopsy more than it would need in a different skin tone or race. So, um, yeah, definitely something I keep in mind with all my patients. Um, and then the pandemic did affect us 
for a little bit. It was, um, we shut down, I don't even know, for like four or five weeks. We were doing telemedicine. Um, I would come in once a week for like three hours and see emergent patients who just had lesions. But um, yeah, so it, it definitely like shut us down for a while and then we opened back up slowly. I would say we're about back to normal, except for I wear an N95 all day um, with another mask over it because it's one that has like a filter. And then um, I wear goggles or like some type of shield too, or my glasses. So that's not, not my favorite thing at all, <laughs> but part, part of, part of the job. All right. So let's get back to my schedule and then we uh, will. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, y'all can keep putting some questions in the comments um, and then I will get to those. Um, I like y'all's questions. <laughs> we might be here for more than an hour. Um, all right. So, oh, I need to know what Daniel's tip is. Sounds like it was a good one. I agree with you. Okay. Um, all right. So looking at my schedule. So I start at eight. Um, I have patients scheduled until 1130. And my 1130 slot is always um, kind of marked for an excision. But if I don't have a surgery, they'll put a regular patient in if needed. And then I start back at one and my last patient is at 350, which is really nice. Um, that's like a practice thing. I was like, I'll work longer, but they they're good with that. I'm good with that. So it's great. Um, but yeah, so I get to work. The first thing I do when I walk in is um, so I have a, like an area and I have my pathology. So any biopsies I've done, any cultures I've done from the last week um, are there. So I can check over those. Any notes from like a Mohs surgeon or a plastic surgeon who saw my patients, I can sign off and make sure that the surgeries got done. Um, I also have my schedule. So I review that. And then I have my notes, my dictated notes from the week before that I sign off on and make sure there aren't any crazy typos or anything. Um, so those are kind of my like get to work housekeeping type things. Um, and then I start seeing patients. So um, on this day, I had 14 patients in the morning and 10 in the afternoon. So I had 24 patients total on my schedule. And... Um, I started with um, just a follow up on eczema um, and, you know, I think we're seeing actually a lot of eczema right now. And I think part of it is actually because people are cleaning more because people's hands are getting hand eczema a lot more um, and using like cleaning products and washing their hands more. Um, so this was a follow up to make sure she was doing better. Um, and so one thing that's really important in what I do is clarifying with patients expectations because if someone has an eczema spot on their wherever hands like this one actually she had some on her lower legs um, we have to talk about what to expect with that because lower legs are going to take longer to heal and for someone who's had a spot for a long time it's probably going to be hyperpigmented so it's going to stay pink or dark or purple um, kind of like if you get a bug bite on your lower leg and it takes a while for that spot to go away or if you get an acne bump and it leaves a little pink spot behind it's not a scar but it is hyperpigmentation um, so when I when someone comes in for an eczema follow-up I'm not expecting them to have nothing on their skin but I am expecting that um, maybe there's just hyperpigmentation, there's no scale, it's not as itchy, that type of thing. And I, I try to talk about that in the initial visit so that people don't come in thinking they're going to have, you know, their normal, back to normal, perfect skin later on. So um, I had that. And then I didn't have another patient until 830 and she no showed. Uh, <laughs> and that was an established patient. And so then at 840, I had someone come in with a plate. So this is what happens on my schedule. The um, scheduler will put something in the appointment notes what they're coming in for, and it is rarely what they're coming in for, or it's like completely different, or they change it, or whatever. So this one came in. It says place on chest. So this place on chest turned into place on chest, place on back, place on face. So really, I was just doing upper body and like checking everything. Um, 
most of the time people have completely normal things. So there's things called seborrheic keratoses, which people refer to as barnacles, um, which are just hereditary type spots, not harmful at all. They look weird. And so people get scared of them, but the good news is not going to hurt them or do anything. So a lot of times people will have those cherry moles, like a little red dot, um, a red mole, like made of blood vessels. See a lot of those all normal. Um, we look at moles all the time. Um, but yeah, and I, I always make a point. So like when I go into a patient encounter and I walk in, um, the first thing I say is like, Hey, I hear you're having, you have a place on your, on your chest. And they're kind of like, yeah, blah, blah. And I'm like, anything, anything else going on with you today? Like, I want to know at the beginning of the appointment, kind of what they want me to touch on. Um, and so, you know, they may tell me something different than they told the medical assistant. Um, so we, we go through that. And then um, after that, sorry, my, my foot's falling asleep. Um, and so after that, um, I do my thing. I'm checking them. We're talking about whatever. And then at the end, I ask every single patient whether I want to or not, um, any other skin stuff. And, and that's how I phrase it, you know, any other skin stuff. And some, a lot of times I'll say no, sometimes they do. Um, if I've prescribed a medicine or kind of given a regimen, a skincare regimen, I'll say, do you have any questions about this? Um, and, and I try to, since I do see a lot of teenagers and pediatric patients, um, I definitely, I, I address the patient. So like, I always address the patient first, like, do you have any questions? And then I'll address the parent. Um, and that's just my, I guess, style of, of providing care. So um, we give a lot of handouts, too. So if there's anything we have a handout about, we try to um, give that to the patient and make sure they have as much information as possible. Um, okay, so let's see what was next. At 8.50... I had a patient come in with complaints of a spot on the back that is bleeding and a spot on her right arm. Um, so on her, I ended up doing three biopsies that I believe were all basal cell skin cancers. I haven't gotten that back yet. I'll get it next week. Um, but yeah, so I, I um, like one was big, very large. So I asked her about it. They'd been there for a month or two, hadn't gone away. She tried moisturizing, not going away. Um, and so we, we did biopsy those. And then at nine o'clock, um, I had a new patient who had, um, a, it's, so here's his fingernail infection. So when she actually came in, what she had was, um, she was an oncology patient who is on a special chemotherapy and it makes her nails separate. So her, as a side effect of that medicine, her fingernails are separating from the nail beds. Um, nails are really hard, especially like with that, it's a side effect. Unless she's not on the medicine anymore, I can't fix that. And she was very understanding of that. Like, that's not why she was there. She was more concerned about, you know, are they getting fungal? There was some discoloration under them. Um, so we were able to do some things to kind of prophylactically uh, make sure that she doesn't get a fungal infection and make sure that there, there is a bacteria that grows under the nails that causes that called pseudomonas. So um, we set her up to, to start working on that. And, and obviously we're not going to change her oncology treatment, but I'm going to kind of manage her, her skin and her nails moving forward. Her hands are also very dry and cracked um, with eczema. So we treated that too. So um, yeah, sometimes medicines in particular illness can make skin do a lot of weird stuff. I promise I'll get to y'all's questions. Um, let's see. Then at 910, I had a patient who no showed for the second time in a row. Um, which happens a lot. Uh, at 9.30, well, at 9.30, I was supposed to have a patient come in for a one-month keloid injection, but he actually showed up at 10.30 and thought his appointment was at 10. So technically, he was still late for when he thought his appointment was, but I, I don't really care. I try to see everyone unless I'm like super behind or if I'm starting a procedure that I know is going to be very long. Um, 
I'm fine seeing them. So he came in. He has some keloids along his jawline from acne bumps. So we've been injecting those um, to soften them and try to make them less um, apparent. Um, 940, I had a new patient. This is mole under leg. What was that? Oh, I remember. So she just had like a little skin tag on the back of her leg. So those I can freeze or snip away. Um, at 10 o'clock, I had a patient with a rash. And so this was actually really interesting. So this was a patient. She was young. She's a new patient. Um, and she has psoriasis and is being seen by a different provider, like a different dermatologist in a different place for psoriasis, but she couldn't go back there now because of COVID right now. Um, and so she came to see us. So we weren't treating that, but then she had this new rash on her hands that was different. And so it was all these tiny bumps kind of on her hands and wrists um, that she felt like were bites, um, which I agreed with. And, um, with bites, we usually can't tell where they're coming from, but the way it was presenting, I was somewhat questionable for scabies and she does work in like a daycare setting. Um, so we went ahead and treated for scabies and um, got her some steroid cream to help calm down the itchiness of her hands. And then we talked about wearing bug spray um, all the time to see if that makes a difference too, or if she can identify like where she's getting bit and when, if it is that type of bug, but it looked more like scabies. Um, so somebody asked a question about scraping. Let's see. So I recently saw a derm PA as a patient and she was able to scrape the area and immediately test under the microscope. Um, so there's only a couple of things that you can do that with, and we do not have that in our office. So, um, fungal infections you can check and, um, scabies you can check. Some people will scrape for rosacea, but it's not very conclusive. Um, I never did that. My first my first office had scraping capabilities, but, um, like after you've done it for a while, like you don't necessarily have to scrape or learn that much from scraping because a lot of it's clinical. So anyway, um, what was next? So then I saw a new patient with a mole. It says mole on left hip. Um, and she actually had two spots there. One was a true mole and one was just a separate keratosis. So I told her they were normal. I said, these are hereditary. And she was like, oh, yeah. She was like, my mom has them. My grandma has them. Makes sense. Um, and so sometimes people just want to know, like, my appointments seem short because they're technically 10 minute slots. But I get the combination of, like, the guy, I've got to check everything and, you know, lots of stuff going on. Um, and then I get the person who's like, oh, they're nothing? Okay, cool. And they don't want me to look at anything else. They, they're they good with that. So it all kind of balances out. Um, at 1030, I had a no-show Accutane patient. And then at 1040... Um, I had a, an established patient with a place on his right forearm. Um, this day was like crazy with like, it seems like everything comes at the same time. So there'll be days where I do no biopsies and then there are days where I do tons of biopsies. So this one, I also biopsied, um, I thought it was probably a squamous cell skin cancer. Um, a difference in the office I used to work at in the office now, like at my old office, I would, you know, anytime we did a biopsy, we planned on um, excising it if needed. At this office, we actually are able to ask for margins. So if a skin cancer, if something I think is a skin cancer seems small, um, I can ask for the margins, which saves the patient from having another procedure and another bill. So I really, really like that. Um, that we're able to do that for our patients and offer that as an option. Um, next patient at 11 was a full body skin exam. Um, and that's pretty typical. So, you know, somebody comes in, just wants us to check everything. Um, I, we put them in a gown. I usually start on their back go to their face, do both arms, do their front and then do their legs, get them to stand up and look at the back of their legs. And, um, and then look at their scalp too. So we just check the person all over, look for anything out of the ordinary. 
a lot of times patients come in and they think they're concerned about one spot and then I end up finding a different spot. Um, yeah. So anyway, the next patient was, see, it says full by skin exam, but the next patient was actually, um, seborrhea or like flaky scalp and acne. Um, so she had just had a baby like six weeks ago. And so her hormones were still kind of out of whack, um, which definitely can make breakouts crazy, make skin crazy. And um, so we got her some good creams to use um, for her breakouts that should help with the bump she was having. Um, and then for her scalp, we got her like a prescription shampoo and a topical steroid to use when it was flaring up. So um, pretty straightforward stuff that I see a lot. Um, okay. Aaliyah's coming in strong with the answers, which I really appreciate. Um, and Natalie. So yeah, I've been, I've been a Durham PA for six years. Um, I'm going to answer some of these questions and then we'll talk about my afternoon. Um, what do I do when patients are no show? Mm, I, uh, talk to my coworkers and I answer Instagram messages and I, um, look things up. If I need to look anything up, I organize the sample closet and get rid of expired things. I make TikTok videos. Um, I just kind of hang out and it's nice. So like my old job, I had gotten to where I was seen, like 35, 30 to 35 patients a day. And now I'm at like that 20 to 25 mark. It, it takes a while to build your patient population back up when you switch practices. Um, and so I, I, it's like kind of nice to have some downtime. So yeah. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Um, are you happy you became a PA rather than an NP or MBE? I am. I, for me, it's great flexibility. The, the route I took was perfect for me. Um, do patients get charged if they no show? No, <laughs> I think like our policies technically say they do, but both offices I've worked at, no one actually charges. Um, do you save charting notes dictating for the end of the day or after each patient? I do it after each patient, um, for the most part. So my priorities at work are that I'm seeing the patients in a timely manner. So like if a patient's ready, even if I have something to do, I'm going to go see them first. And um, so, yeah, so seeing the patients is first. And then when I come out, I try to dictate right away. I like don't go to lunch until my morning's done dictated. I don't know if that's correct. Um, and then I'll, I'll do the same afternoon. I try to try to stay on top of it and try to because the more patients I see, the more I'm going to forget. Like it's easier if it's just fresh in my mind. Can you describe a time you asked for a second opinion or something you had no idea what it was or what it was about? Do you call in? Let me see if any of these were that day. Um, I don't think any of these were patients I had asked for a second opinion. Um, so, like, I had a patient last, it was on Tuesday, and she was a younger patient, like, I think she was 16 or 17 and she had a funny mole. Well, she had this funny patch of moles on her shoulder. And so she had been into the office like six years ago and saw the PA that was there at the time and the doctor and had a spot biopsy that came back as what's called a spitz nevus, which is like a mole with irregular pigment. Um, but then this new like weird pigmentation has just started over the last couple of years. So it was just weird. And so it was large too. I mean, it was probably the whole patch was like three and a half, four centimeters. So um, in that case, I went and got the physician and I brought her in and we both looked at it and kind of came up with a plan um, because she'd seen it before, even though she didn't really remember it. And I like, I'm not going to go cut this huge chunk out. And so it was like, do we take a piece of it? Like, how do we attack this? And then also like, honestly, part of it was for the mom's peace of mind, like to know that, you know, this is something we're working on together that we're discussing. Um, it kind of just makes the patient and the patient's parents feel better. And especially in someone that young, like, unless, I mean, I'll definitely cut on them without, 
approval or anything or like talking to her. But there are also times where just it's kind of to make the situation more approachable for everyone um, that it helps to have her involvement. But I would say, you know, I I don't even I don't always need her to look at stuff. Maybe once a week, if that it, it depends. And then again, it feels like it comes in waves. Like there are days where me and the other PA, PA will talk about like we're so needy because um, we'll both just have days where it's we're calling her in all the time and talking to her. So anyway, but she loves it. She's great. Like she will drop what she's doing. Both of the doctors I've worked with, they drop what they're doing and they come and see my patients. And I'm like, no, you don't have to. You can wait. You can finish what you're doing. But they, they're awesome. And they're just really nice and like really great people. Um, do you ever feel like you gave the wrong diagnosis or treatment? If so, what do you do? Um, so I mean, I've definitely seen patients in follow up that what they have looks different or what I did didn't work. So if it, it didn't work at all, you know, a lot of times in skin, we're going to take a biopsy. Um, and, you know, I've had patients, there's, there's something called there's a type of lymphoma in the skin that can be very hard to diagnose. Like the average diagnosis takes four or five biopsies to diagnose it. And I did have a case like that um, where we biopsied him like three times. Me and the doctor were seeing him. Um, it was coming back as eczema, contact dermatitis, psoriasis. So we were doing all this different stuff, trying different things. Um, he ended up going to see a special skin allergy doctor. Um, and on her second biopsy, it finally came back as lymphoma, even though we, you know, put that in our differential and checked it. Um, and so there are definitely times where we're wrong. And, and I mean, I'm very honest with patients about that if I, if I get something wrong. Um, I would never say my physicians have been too busy for me. Um, I am very strict about HIPAA and I like, I check the chart every single time. Um, um, how do you excuse yourself from a patient that might be taking too much of your time when other patients are waiting for you? Ooh, I am, uh, I, so, okay, I'm very, like, I, I'm, we stay on topic in my rooms. I don't know how to say that better or easier. Like, we stay on topic, and, um, you know, if I need to move on, like, I, I can wrap it up pretty well, like, and get out of the room if I need to. There are definitely ones who, who talk a lot or get really off topic, but, um, for the most part, like, I, I can kind of, redirect back to their skin and move on a good work-life balance um you're gonna get me on a tangent um so for work-life balance i mean i think you choose that no matter what your profession or job or location or setting or anything like you choose your work-life balance um I do think this gives me that and, and but at the same time like I've just learned it's never going to be perfect it's never going to be a balance <laughs> at all um it is going to be definitely something that you have to continue working on constantly um so now that I'm part-time right now so I have a two-year-old and I worked so I I had worked for four years I had her and then I worked for another year full time and it was just too much. Like I, I was stressed out and that and frustrated more than I was happy. Um, I didn't feel like I was doing anything well. I didn't feel like I was keeping up with the PA platform. I didn't feel like I was being a good mom or wife or at work. I didn't feel like I could focus. Um, and so it kind of got to the point where like something had to give, but none of those were things that I wanted to give up completely. Um, and so that's when I made the decision to go to part time, which did require switching practices. Um, but now I've been so happy and my husband sees it. My family sees it. I don't break out as much. I'm not as stressed out. It's just 
all around better, but that's a choice I made. Even though I loved who I worked with previously, for me to choose that work-life balance, it did require making a change. Um, my practice just gets me new patients. I was 20, let's think. I was technically 21 when I got into PA school and 22 when I started and 24 when I finished and 23 when I got married and I am 30 now. Okay. I'll stick to the list. I think that's what um, I do not work weekends. I work Mondays and Tuesdays. I may add Fridays in the future. That's like kind of the plan. But right now it's like we don't have I don't have the patience to do that. And so they're really nice about being like, listen, once your schedule is full, we can add more time. Um, but like you don't have to. OK. I'm going to go off these questions. Um, was there a time when you felt like you couldn't continue on your journey? If so, why, um, and what motivated you and how did you overcome that low point? So that was a question on Instagram that I thought was really good. So I, like a couple, I wouldn't say there's, I felt like I couldn't keep going, but there have been a couple of times that were hard. So like right after I started a couple months in, I was on call and this mom was, freaking out about a procedure I'd done to their child, sending me pictures and like just freaking out. And so I had done the procedure correctly. I had, you know, done what I was supposed to do. But that at that point in time, I had not explained expectations clear enough of what was going to happen. And so um, that was a big learning curve for me in both, you know, patient communication, but also um, I felt very frustrated and defeated. And I felt like I had messed up and I'd done something wrong and I wasn't doing a good job and all this stuff. Um, and so I was like sitting at home crying about this. And then my husband was really great because he was like, this is not your fault. This is part of medicine. Like, do you feel like you provided the best care you could? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and so we talked about it. And then once I got to work, my physician said the same things like, no, you did what was appropriate for that patient. Um, these are things you can tell them next time or prepare them. And now you know better to do that. But like you didn't do anything wrong. And so having their support was really great and helpful. And it also just taught me like, I may not always communicate things in a perfect way and that's okay. Like I just need to do better and I got to keep working on it. Um, and I would say the other time was when I was trying to decide about going part time, like that year when I got, I, I never thought I'd be the person who like wanted to stay home um, at all. And so once I had my child, I did not want to go back after maternity leave at all. Like I, I first day I had to get back. I was like sobbing, um, begging my husband not to make me go. I was like, please don't make me go. Please don't make me go. He's like, I'm not making you go, but this is your job. You have to go. Um, she'll be fine. And so it was just a tough year. Like I wanted to be at home. I wanted to be there more. I wanted to hang out with her more. Um, leaving her with a nanny was very hard for me. Um, and so I just wrestled like for that whole year. Like, what do I do? What do I do? I love my job. I've worked really hard to get here. Um, but I love my child and I want to be there for her, but I also want to be an example for her. And so um, it took that whole year for me to really make the decision that that going part time was the best thing for me at the time. So anyway, um, I talked about that one. So let's talk about working as a derm MA for just a second. So to get your foot in the door, I would say even if 
look at your state re requirements and see if you have to be certified as a medical assistant. Most states actually don't require certification for MAs. Um, and so then if you can go to a practice, particularly like a smaller one, send your resume to the office manager, call and, and send it, drop it off and just let them know, like write a letter about your intent and that you're a pre-health student. A lot of places will want that because they know that you're motivated, that you're going to be a great employee. You're going to pick things up quickly. You're intelligent. Um, not to say that other MAs aren't, but I think there's just a fire under pre-PA students. Like we are, we, we get things done. And so, um, so that's definitely a benefit. Derm is very fast paced. It, it's very, there's lots of prescriptions, lots of, of different just, you know, procedures to do. Um, but yeah, so that, that is, um, like it, it definitely is a possibility. So the jobs are probably few and far between, but they're out there. Um, okay. I'm going to go to some Instagram questions now. How do you deal with patients who are non-compliant or have difficulty sticking with a treatment? Um, I guess that goes back to me being fairly blunt um, again. So like I, I let them know, like, if you're not going to do this, I, I might not be able to help you. So if I have an eczema patient saying like, I'm not going to moisturize, I don't like the feeling of it on my skin. Well, like that is part of the treatment plan for eczema. And if if you aren't willing to do that, we may only get so far um, and I'll do what I can and try to help you as much as I can. But what we're able to do might be limited. Um, same thing with like an acne patient. If someone's refusing, you know, isn't really motivated to use their topicals. Um, I explain that like, well, we may only be able to get part of your acne cleared up if you aren't going to be um, compliant, you know. Um so I just kind of let them know, like, whether or not they get better is on how much they're willing to work on it. Same thing with warts because they can be really hard to go away. All right. Read an online article that said full-time Durham PA salary is eighty to 400000 depending on experience and collections. True. Um, that is true. A lot of it depends on, you know, location, what you do. Um, there are a couple of PAs who do a lot of – they – they do Mohs or do like the majority of the Mohs procedure in their practices um, that I have heard reaching those super high numbers. Um, and also that has to do with like the location they're, they're in. Um, at about average starting salary for any PA is around 85000 So one thing you'll hear about in Durham is um, that there is a – a lot of times like a training period where you may get a lower salary for a little bit before you're able to start really seeing patients on your own. Um, that's a little bit of a controversial thing, but it a lot of times helps you get your foot in the door and get that really good base training that you need. Um, that is not the standard where I'm at. So it depends on where you're at. Um, are there any procedures you're not comfortable with yet? I think I may have kind of answered this one, but just the bigger ones and like faces on young people. I don't like doing things on kids, but I will. Um, just depending on what it is and where it is. And, and there's a lot of like us talking about it, using numbing cream and things like that. Ice. Um, how much autonomy do you have? I would say in my current practice, I have as much as I want. Um, and so there really is like, there's a really great level of trust that I'm going to make decisions that are sound and are within my scope of practice and within what I am able to do and what I feel comfortable with. Um, yeah, so yeah, I feel good about my level of independence. Um, so I don't really have a scribe because we don't use EMR. So I just have a medical assistant who basically like does my scribing. But ours, it's, it's since we're in skin, it's a diagram. So she's really just marking on there like 
a mole here and like puts the measurements or wart on the hand or whatever. Sorry, I'm like coming at y'all with my gel pen. Um, how do you stay up to date with the field? Any specific sites or books? I'm in a lot of like Derm PA groups on, there's one on Facebook and I am in some group messages on Instagram. And those are really helpful because we all share stuff. And then from PA school, two of my friends, so I had three best friends in PA school. Two of them ended up in dermatology. One is in Texas and one is local here with me. And then um, the third one ended up in surgical oncology. So she sees a lot of melanoma stuff. So we all have fairly similar positions or similar areas that we're in, which is really cool because we can talk about things. So even today I was texting my friend in Texas and she was sending me pictures of a lipoma she took out. That was nine centimeters. She was trained in surgery. So the way our jobs are different, her first arm job was strictly surgical. So she learned all this crazy stuff. She learned to do these huge excisions and she learned how to do flaps um, and all kinds of stuff. So she feels very comfortable doing that. Um, but she doesn't do as much cosmetics cause she wasn't really ever trained in that. Um, but yeah, so she was sending me stuff. We were talking about like, what's your go-to for perioral dermatitis and, you know, just kind of going back and forth. Um, so yeah, so that's really cool that we're able to do that. Conferences, I think are the, the best, the germ conferences are so great because, um, they're very like content, focused and they just give you tons of pearls and like practical stuff it's not as much like research driven like some of the other like um big like physician derm ones what is the process for negotiating who does what procedures do you review everything coming in before the physician so yeah so i review all my own path um, and then it's not really like a negotiation. It's more like if I want to do it, I do it. If I don't, I'll ask her or I know, I kind of just know, like I know what she wants to do and I know what she'll send out. So if we need to send something to Mo's or we need to send something to plastics, like I just make that call. Um, and I mean, sometimes if I'm unsure, I'll ask her like, Hey, do you want to do this? Um, or I, more likely I'll ask her medical assistant. Um, but one of us decides. There is another PA in my office and she is awesome. Do any other Derm PAs work in hospitals? I don't know of any personally. Um, some PAs may take like hospital call or if you worked in like an academic center maybe, but um, there's not a ton of dermatology and hospital medicine. Any advice on getting a derm election during clinical rotation elective during clinical year or gain into derm as a new grad. So I did a whole podcast episode on that. So if you Google the PA platform, how to get a job, um, it's specifically really about getting a derm job. And I go into so much detail. How do you work with patients with a limited coverage or insurance plan without impacting quality of treatment plan? So we see, a lot of different insurances and we see cash pay patients. Um, and so I always look at different things. So if they need, okay, so let's say that they come in and they have a precancerous spot. I will look at, okay, this is going to be the cost if we do a procedure for it versus this is the cost if we do a cream for it. And we figure out based on whatever works best for them um, cost wise, how that's going to look. Um, we do have a, a local um, income based clinic here that we work with and um, we basically see their patients for free um, just because of a relationship we've established with them and, and knowing, knowing the need that is there um, in that area. So um, that's kind of like a special thing. And then I, so it's hard because I can never know exactly like what insurance is going to cover um, until I send something. And so that's sometimes hard to explain to a patient. Like even if I look it up, it might be different. Um, dermatology is also specific. Sorry, this chair is like hitting that this weekend. Um, dermatology is also specific in that 
Um, our drugs, so we use a lot of medications that are branded. And so they've started going to something called specialty pharmacies. So that's something else I have to talk to patients about because a lot of times to get the best price, um, they have to go to a specialty pharmacy. And sometimes people don't want to do that. And so then we talk about, well, that's fine. But if you go to CVS, you might end up having to, you know, pay more money. Um, so I wouldn't say the care I provide depends on what their insurance will cover. It's more um, kind of figuring out what options are both the most cost effective and the best for the patient. Because the other thing in dermatology is we have tons of options. So when it comes to retinoids, I have 20 options when it comes to, you know, what else? Like skin, like these creams we use for precancers and skin cancers. I have probably six or seven options. Biologics, there's 12 now. Like there's lots of options and one's not necessarily better than the other. So um, it's really like part of that does come into play with like what's going to be the most cost effective for the patient. But then it's nice if their insurance like won't cover something, we can get something else. Even Accutane, there's five different ones. Um, do patients get mad when you're wrong? How do you handle it? I can't really think of an in, of a um, an instance where patients have gotten really mad at us um, or mad at me. Because I think part of that's in communication, like and in skin. You know, I we we do keep close follow ups. We do say like you know if this isn't better, like this is the next step. So it's never like oh like a hundred percent, I'm never wrong. It's this, like, there's definitely like, okay, like I want to make sure this is getting better too. Let's check back in later type thing. Um, let's see a couple of questions coming up here, but I'll keep going here. Um, how do you deal with patients who are not following the treatment plan, but continue to come back? I answered this earlier. Like I'm, I'm very straightforward. Like, um, have you had rude patients that have told you something like, I would like to talk to the doctor to believe it, or PAs don't get that kind of things? No one's rude like that. Um, if anything, they'll usually just say like, am I seeing the doctor today or something like that? Um, and so in those cases, you know, I explain, you know, like you were on my schedule, you know, if I felt like you needed to see the doctor, if there was anything going on, like we would, we, I would get her um, and that type of thing. So, you know, if they really insist, I make sure that like the next time they're scheduled with the doctor, but if it's something straightforward, like if it's like, I remember one time I had a patient come in with a burn on her arm from the oven and she was like insisting on seeing the doctor. And I was like, well, you know, it's a burn. And I know it's a burn and I know she's only going to tell you to put Vaseline on it. And that's what I'm telling you to do. Um, but she was so insistent. And so I like went through like, well, you need to keep Vaseline up, blah, blah, blah. And so then she, I, I went and got the doctor and I was like, listen, like, she's not going to leave till you come see her. And so she came in she was like, oh yeah, it's a burn. Put Vaseline on. She's like, oh, that's what, that's what your PA said. It's like, yeah, like she doesn't have anything extra like magical for you. Um, and like I said, if she, if I, if I needed her, I would get her. Um, and sometimes they're asking, like usually it's not a malicious question. It's more just kind of like, uh, a, they're kind of wondering about things type, type thing. Um, I saw a question. Do I think Medicare for all would improve PA practice or not? I not in dermatology um, or not how it is right now. If it was Medicare, Medicare does not cover any medications, even if it's one I desperately need for a patient. It's fairly awful. Um, what is your opinion on the PA modernization act? I don't really know that. Are, are you talking about like OTP? Like optimal team practice, maybe some states call it that. 
I'm not sure. Um, I personally am happy with my scope of practice. Um, and I'm, I think the PAs in Georgia are working really well and really hard at, you know, making sure that we maintain our autonomy. Um, but some other states aren't like that. But I think that it's just a state by state kind of thing. Let's see. How do you prepare for a new specialty if you decide to switch from derm to something such as neuro? Is there a postmaster certification class to take to show you know the procedures you'll have to do? Um, so, I mean, if I were to switch today, it would just be on on the job training. So, you know, I would go in and um, get new training. I would learn myself if I had to learn new stuff. But um, every like that's going to look different too, like what that training looks like. But there really aren't there are a few residencies out there, but not not a ton as far as like different specialties and like not in derm. Um, okay. So yeah, like OTP, like removing the need for a supervising physician. Um, I do not support independent practice for PAs. I think that that's not how our profession was established or designed. Um, I think that we need, need that collaborative relationship. PA school is not med school. PA training is not residency. Um, I'm married to a doctor. I can say that 100% because I've watched him go through it and we've had these conversations. Um, I think PAs are wonderful and I think the training we get is wonderful, but I think, I, I think there's a place for everyone in medicine. And so I think that relationship needs to remain. Um, do I think doing a dermatology residency will give you a competitive advantage? It depends on where you're at. So like I'm in a suburban area. So I was able to just get a job. If you're looking for something in like a bigger city, you will need um, more like probably more training, more experience to get those positions. All right. As a PA, how comfortable are you with Accutane patients? I work at a family medicine practice and the MD is only in charge of eye pledge versus his NPs. I see Accutane all day, every day. Like, I mean, so like there were a couple on here that didn't come in, but like I see tons of Accutane. I do tons of Accutane. Um, it, it's a, it's a relatively safe medication. There's just more things to monitor um, and kind of stay on top of, but ultimately like I, I think it's great and I use it a lot. So um, yeah, I would say my comfort level is perfectly fine. If I did have someone who let's say like, has some things going on, like a major history of depression or um, other other kind of issues that may be an issue. Like I would definitely check in with my supervising physician. We check in with their primary care physicians and um, or physicians and their um, like any like psych providers too. So kind of a team approach there. Okay, I think I'm about to wrap this up. I'll answer these like. Last few questions here and we'll wrap it up. And if I didn't answer your questions, send them to me. I will try to answer. Um, this is a good question. What is the coolest, most memorable diagnosis and what was the treatment plan? Um, let me think. That's hard. So I'd say like this one stands out to me just because it was interesting. I had this guy with this rash on his feet and it was like fairly early in my practice, like within a year. Um, and it, they were just like red and crusted, but then like smelled fungal and I don't know. It was just weird. And so I was just like, I don't know what you have going on. Like it seems like you have a lot of stuff going on. Um, and so I was able to treat him. I did a culture. There was like three different types of bacteria growing on his feet. Um, we treated for fungus. We treated for bacteria. We, it was kind of a stepwise thing. Like it took about like six weeks, but by the end of it, his feet looked completely normal and he was just so grateful. Like he, and he went to my church 
And so he was like really funny. He was like, I was looking for you to show you my feet. Um, and so he was just like, he had pictures from the beginning of what they looked like and then what they looked like at the end. And like, just, I think that's the cool thing about Durham, like seeing that improvement. And like when I first think like the ones that come to mind are some of my like Accutane patients or acne patients who have gotten so much better and like their just whole personality and mood changes. Um, and then I have some patients who just are funny, like some they'll like pick on me and I pick on them, you know, we just have this, this rapport and this relationship that we've developed. And, and some of those patients did follow me and, and kind of found me at my new practice too. How do I feel about MPs practicing, practicing independently? Um, I, uh, so, so I think in doing that, MPs have established a reputation that in some places is not that great because not everyone should practice independently. There are some that are great um, to do that. But I like, so in Georgia, just for example, MPs at one point, like a few years ago, were given, given permission to operate clinics independently. Um, that lasted about two years and then it was taken away. So PAs and MPs work identically in Georgia. And, um, and that's part of why I say like, I think Georgia is doing a good job of like making sure that everything is in the patient's best interest. Um, PAs can work in different specialties, different locations. Um, I don't really see patients on hospice. Um, one question I saw was like, or where did it go? Like um, your first time telling someone they had skin cancer and how did they handle it? I don't remember probably my like very first time. But I do remember my first melanoma because it was a 27 year old um, and I was 25 at the time and it was on her back and it wasn't like super invasive. It wasn't terrible, but it was still just kind of eye opening. I was like, oh crap, like I am that old almost like it, it was just, yeah. So it, um, that, that was interesting, but it was also like, I could relate to her cause we were kind of the same age. Um, but yeah, that was my very first melanoma. Derm is great. All right. Okay. I'm going to wrap up. Thank y'all for watching. The replay link will go out and yeah. So I hope this was helpful. Oh, oh, I have to announce the next one. So um, mark your calendars. Let me pull up my calendar so I say this right. Four, and this is tentative. He told me he could do it. August 27th, which is also a Thursday at 8 p.m. Um, I am planning on having the Brian Palm on here to talk about his day in the life as a nocturnal PA. So he works nights. He's only ever worked nights in the ER. Um, and so he'll just talk to you all night long if you want him to. And no, I'm just kidding. But he, um, we will hear more about like what he does, what he sees, what his scope is there so yes I'm very excited to have him on as my first official guest um and then I know a lot of y'all commented um when I asked earlier like what specialties you wanted to see so I've got some people in mind but if there's anyone that you'd like me to ask to come on here let me know and I'll try to reach out and get them to also come so that we can talk about what they do too so I hope that was that was helpful for you guys and I will see y'all around. Bye. Oh, Ariana, yeah, she's awesome. I'll ask her. All right. Oh, Lore, of course. Okay. Y'all have some good ideas. All right, bye y'all.